What's going on, everyone? And welcome back to another episode of the Midwest Outdoors podcast. As always, I'm your host, Jim O'Neill, and we are brought to you by Fish Daddy. Hey, we got the floral shirt on. It's 90 degrees outside, and I am ready for summer to be here. But I know in the upper part of the Midwest, spring's not quite over yet, but that is why this is my favorite time to fish. You know, it's a great time to catch walleye, bass, panfish, musky, everything's moving, and a lot of things are thinking about having babies and that spawn. And a lot of the conversation we're gonna have in today's interview is about spawning fish. We're also gonna go over Door County, one of the most beautiful places I've ever been, and the peninsula of Wisconsin that's actually the most biodiverse place in the United States besides the Everglades. And half of that is the reason why it is truly my favorite place in the Midwest to visit. But we're going to we're going to talk about that coming up, but we had a lot go on since our last podcast. So, I can't wait to get into it. We love talking about the records and this is one of my favorite fish to talk about. A 43-year-old record just fell in Indiana for the lake perch. That's right. You guys remember all those big perch we were catching in the city of Chicago? Well, those usually migrate over towards Indiana, out towards the flats and deep into the lake throughout the year. Well, last month, the mayor of Hammond, Indiana always puts together this little derby, right? And this gentleman by the name of Lass Lara, if that's not a TV name, I don't know. Blast Lara caught a three pound, two ounce yellow perch. Massive, big belly on it, but it's not shocking to me at all. Over the last two years, we've seen these perch get bigger and bigger, seeing fish in the 14 to 16 inch range. It's only a matter of time before Michigan, Wisconsin, Illinois, I think they're all gonna fall. But hey, congrats catching a beautiful fish and offshore, proving that you don't need a boat to catch big fish. Also around home, we had some controversy, all right? And although all the details can't come out yet because it's still a pending investigation, we may have a cheater on the south side of Chicago near Indiana. Um, the CalSag Bass Tournament Series had an, had an event on May 11th, and lo and behold, when the anglers came in to weigh in, there was a bunch of DNR officers, conservation officers, waiting, and everyone thought they were getting their license checked or their boats checked, but they were there for one individual. Now, once this case is closed, we'll have a lot more for you guys. We even have a video, believe it or not. That's right, we have a video of the individual accused of cheating, grabbing fish, putting them on a stringer, and then taking the fish off said stringer the next morning during the tournament and putting them in his live well. The DNR didn't let him weigh in, right? They confiscated the fish after what I believe happened is they weighed them and measured them the morning of, and then they were able to confirm that those were the fish that he had in his live well. But they confiscated them from him before he was able to weigh in. So this does make me think, right? Was that the right move? Should he have weighed in the fish, therefore cheating, actually? Because although it's almost impossible to say the intent was not to cheat, um, he never weighed him in officially. So I just wonder how that's going to go kind of through the court system, you know, and if he'll get away with a lesser of a punishment than he should have. Everyone makes mistakes, however, when you plan something out for over a day beforehand to intentionally do wrong and beat your fellow anglers, your friends, your family, and disgrace the name of bass fishing, I'm sorry, you have no room in this sport anymore for that. So we have to report on this, not to give the cheaters any glorification, but to make it known that there's no place for this in the sport. Um, it just puts a bad name for fishing in general, and we just need to get past this because the fun, the fun competitiveness of a tournament is knowing that everyone's at a somewhat even playing field and you never know what could happen. But unfortunately on that day, the results were over before the tournament even started. So that's all I have to say about that. Hey, don't cheat, you will get caught. The MLF heavy hitters 
is going on right now. Uh, they're down in Florida, you know, they're catching big Florida bass, but this is far from the best time to fish in Florida. So the numbers aren't incredible, but a lot of five to seven, eight pound fish are being caught. And the big reason we talk about this event is it is possibly, as he says, as of right now, Kevin Van Dam's last tournament. Um, he made the first cut, so there's a chance he could be a winner in his last tournament ever, but we'll have to wrap up this podcast so I could get back to watching that once we're done and see what unfolds this week. So good luck, Kevin. Hey, I hope you make a storybook ending. Speaking of tournaments, registration is now open for the South Shore Bass Tournament. This is gonna be an event unlike any other on the South Side. It is going to be hopefully one day, much like the Sturgeon Bay Open, which is perfect we're talking about that because we actually have the winners joining us. So if you guys like what you see, if you like the fact that the winners won over $10,000, um, you'll like the South Shore Bass Open because on a full field, first place is gonna pay out 30 grand. So make sure you guys sign up if you're a bass angler from Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, or Michigan, everyone's welcome. Hey, it only takes five to take home a huge purse. So link below, sign up if you guys wanna try your hand in a big bass tournament or if bass tournament fishing is your weekend every week. Without further ado, we are going to join the winners from the Sturgeon Bay Open that I was fortunate enough to catch up with after their win this past weekend. All right, everyone, hey, we are here at the 34th annual Sturgeon Bay Open, and we're with Tyler and Brent. And uh, guys, first emotions, you just won the Sturgeon Bay Open. Not your first one, right? Your first one. First, first time. So it means that. a little something. It means it means a lot. I mean, we grew up, you know, pretty close to, to Little Sturgeon, um, and, and we've been fishing here for 20 years. Uh, we always look forward to this tournament. Brent and I started fishing this, what, probably six, seven years ago together consistently. And uh, we've, we've been consistently getting better, you know, making the right decisions. And this weekend it really came together. And, and Brent really keyed us in on the bite. You know, during the tournament we adjusted and, and, and it was just a blast. I mean, we didn't think we had it won. We were getting nervous once we started not calling anymore because we couldn't, but um, it was, it was God was looking out for us. And, uh, and yeah, it was just, we're, we're very blessed. Well, hey, good news is when you can't call anymore and you're still catching big fish, beautiful feeling, oh, right? Yeah. All right, Brent, first first feelings, first words that come to mind, and what was that change that keyed you in on that bite? You know, first of all, proud of what we accomplished because we, we look at this week, Tyler and I, as literally going to work. You know, we take off from our jobs, we specifically key in, we put in 12 to 14 hour days, you know, working at trying to figure out these fish. Um, you know, yesterday it was really the conditions. It, we read the conditions, you know, we talk a lot back and forth, and it was slick calm. You know, it was slick calm. I know a lot of fish, uh, a lot of anglers were looking at them down south. We feel we could have caught them up north, you know, where we were, and we just slowed down. They're slick calm, we did, they were spooky, and when, once we did that, I mean, that, that was the deal. So a lot of people were talking about bed fishing. Were most, none, or all your fish on the beds? Absolutely no fish got caught in our boat on a bed this week. Zero. Zero. So you guys actually fished, huh? We fished, you know, and we took great pride in that. Like I said on stage, you know, I really thought this tournament could be one not bed fishing. You know, it's very, very difficult to come to get two big bags consistently on a bed where we knew the class of fish that we were on. It's just a matter of getting the right bites. And I mean, somebody gave them to us this morning. Awesome. So the question is now, are you going out tomorrow to catch them again? You know, my wife wants me to go back to work pretty soon. I might take another couple days off. I'm probably gonna, probably just gonna soak this one in tomorrow, but maybe Monday. We might be out Monday. All right, boys, let's see those trophies. Congrats. Your 2024 winners here on the Midwest Outdoors podcast. Stay tuned, we'll be right back from this commercial break. Midwest Outdoors magazine helps you enjoy the outdoors, giving you the best information on where to go, what to use, and how to use it. With fishing maps marked by the pros, nature notes, in-depth interviews, and much, much more. Your subscription gets you 10 big issues of the best in fishing, hunting, and the great outdoors. Plus, Midwest Outdoors digital edition gives you dozens of extra articles. Sign up now at MWOMag.com. 
That's MWOMag.com. From the company that brought innovation to the ice fishing world with their advancements in LED and glow technology, now brings you a new eco-friendly biosilicone bait that is infused with terabyte. A proprietary solution comprised of amino acid, omega-3, and pheromones that will generate more strikes, which equals more fish. For more information, visit fishdaddyoutdoors.com. Welcome back, everyone. I hope you enjoyed that interview. You know, that is a tournament that I've known about for years. I've always said I want to compete in it, but never felt good enough. You know, the Johnson Brothers Elite Series Anglers have won it multiple times. Um, guides that are famous, you know, world famous guides like Eric Hadia, you know, have won it before. So people come from all over and fish it. I, I think I saw four different Elite Series anglers there this past weekend, which is not your normal, you know, weekend event. You're not used to seeing it. Now, before I jump into the fishing report from Sturgeon Bay, I got a call from my buddy and Midwest Outdoors host, Greg Jones, who was out with one of our friends, Dumper Dan, and they had one of the absolute best coho fishing in years caught on camera. So we're gonna throw it to Greg to see what's going on out there. It's May out here on Port of Sheboygan, Lake Michigan. The coho, coho are in and they are on a tear this morning. This is probably, we've been out for two hours now and that's probably about fish 20 and we've, we've lost uh, more than we've caught, that's for sure. The coho salmon are running really big this year. Yeah, Greg. nice one's chunky, that's for sure. Absolutely. This bite's been going about a week now is when it started? Yeah, almost two weeks ago now. Yep. Uh, the whole entire month of May, this yep. bite is just red hot on Lake Michigan yep. here on the western shores. What's it, water temperature? Are those fish migrate up with the temperature? Yeah, they actually come from the south end of the lake, migrate north. They migrate more than any of the species we catch out here of trout and salmon. So I, I follow them a lot with talking to other ports, other captains, other anglers. Yep. Um, and I kind of know when they arrive here because they just keep moving northbound. And right now, all these fish are anywhere from Door County all the way down to the state line of Illinois, uh, Wisconsin. So there's coho everywhere. Well, those fish are here because the bait fish are here. You look at the depth finder yep. when we cruise through here and the AOIs are just packed. Absolutely. What's yep. unique about the Port of Sheboygan is we have a natural river system. We have the mud line coming out. It's a temp change, a lot of bait in that coffee colored uh, brown water and they're in there feeding on the bait fish and you work the edges of that and through the, the river water and it. Uh, that's where all these coho are at at that time and water temperatures are perfect right now. They're in the upper 40s, low 50s. Um, water is warming up, but all the bait is in here right now. Alewife, walls of bait fish everywhere, and that's what these cohos are feeding on. No doubt the bite has uh, just been on like crazy. This is about fish number 20, and uh, we've had far more hooked up than we've caught. I bet we've had probably 50 hookups this morning. Oh, yeah. Now this, a couple uh, hours. Yeah, yeah, we're two hours <laughs> into the day. It's a little <laughs> after 7 in the crazy, morning, and actually. we started at 5, and it's been going the I whole time. I didn't finish time. my first <laughs> cup of coffee yeah, yet. We had two or three doubles. We got a triple that's started with another fish, so you can call that one a quad. It's been a great yep. morning of fishing. Now, Absolutely. once we go through the coho part of the season, what comes next? And um, then we start targeting the king salmon, the steelhead or rainbow trout. We'll catch lake trout, a uh, good variety throughout the summer months. Um, but right now, month of May, you need to really get out here and reel these fish into the grill because they are delicious. I oh, mean, it's a bright red meat, very good to eat. Uh, pink, gorgeous, um, and easy to cook. Right? Oh yeah. yeah. My neighbors love it when I come out and uh, catch these fish. Yeah. They're, they're waiting for the truck to pull into the driveway <laughs> right. when I get home, yeah. that's for sure. Cut your lawn for free. Yeah. <laughs> and Dan, if uh, <laughs> folks want to come out and do the fishing, how do they do it? The best way is to give me a call on my cell phone. I answer it nonstop, 920-377-1147. Um, You'll talk to me, Dumper Dan. Um, I'll answer all your questions, get your reservations in for you. Dumperdan.com on the internet. Uh, check us out, our rates, um, and then jump over to our Facebook page, which you can access from our homepage at Dumperdan.com. Uh, my captains, first mates, myself, we post fishing reports every single day with videos, pictures, reports. Got the condos right along the river, you 50 bet. yards away from the boats. Yep. Fleet of six boats, uh, got captains, first mates, they make it easy. All you gotta do is get yourself here. Folks, look up Dumper Dan and come on out and catch some fish. You bet, fish on, get the net. Now, the bite was so hot, in fact, 
I ran up there the next day and we caught a six man limit in less than two hours. So there's a lot of guides out there. There's a lot of charter captains and you can catch fish, but if you guys want to be on one of the absolute hottest coho bites we've ever seen, give Dumper Dan a call and he'll put you on. If you can't make it in the next week or two before these coho go deeper, hey, the king salmon and the steelhead are gonna follow, so you will always be on the fish. Now, as for my report, we're up in Sturgeon Bay, you know, and I, and I didn't think I was gonna be able to get on the water, but I was able to go out with a friend for a couple hours, and this time is a really interesting time to fish because I've got a few different spots in the greater Sturgeon Bay area that seem to hold fish really year round almost. Um, those fish were not there because the fish were spawning. And although not every fish spawns at the same time, and you can still find some fish deeper and some cruising like we saw, a lot of the three to six pound bass were locked on beds. Some would bite right away because they hadn't been pressured yet. Um, others, you could fish for a half hour and not get a single bite, they'll just run off the bed. And that just shows the pressure on how many people are fishing these fish. I'm all for good fun, you know, I'm all for catching big fish and when fish are spawning, it is, it is truly one of the best times to catch a possible PB or, or a true world quality class fish. But the more I think about and look at what happens to a betting fish, you have to remember, right? These fish are protecting their young. Their young are the year classes that we want. When we complain about there not being enough fish, well, we always point our heads to the stocking efforts, right? Oh, there's not enough stocking, there's not enough stocking, or there's too much pressure. Well, I've been reading research lately, and there's about to be a document that comes out, um, a 22-year-plus study on what happens to bass when they're spawning. And the results are absolutely dismal when it comes to the success of those fry and those eggs is detrimental when a fish leaves its bed for a lot of time. Um, a male is the protector of the bed for the most part and a lot of results show that up to 80% of the fry that are in a bed get lost if the male leaves the bed for over 10 minutes. Now when you think about that in a lot of spawning situations, especially in a tournament, um, not only is the female desired, right, the bigger fish normally, um, but sometimes you just roll up to a bed and only see a male, or you know the female only bites after the male gets caught, or may maybe let's say the male is a big enough fish to get weighed in. Now you're leaving all those juveniles unguarded. Crayfish, bluegill, even minnows because of how small the fry is when it first comes out. All these things will rabbit on the bed. They will absolutely eat everything and leave very little to survive. So, unless necessary, I just want everyone to keep in mind that fishing for spawning fish, although I've done it my whole life, now going forward, I might think twice about because what's most important is fish for generations to come. I was only out there for a couple hours, right? So I can tell you, we caught them on white craws, white uh, Ned rigs in the middle of a bed. Again, like I said, how you feel about that? These fish got caught and released right back into the water. Now someone that does fish the Door County area quite a bit and has been there for years guiding is our buddy Josh Woodward. So we're gonna take a quick commercial break and we're gonna be right back with Josh. Midwest Outdoors Magazine helps you enjoy the outdoors, giving you the best information on where to go, what to use, and how to use it. With fishing maps marked by the pros, nature notes, in-depth interviews, and much, much more. Your subscription gets you 10 big issues of the best in fishing, hunting, and the great outdoors. Plus, Midwest Outdoors Digital Edition gives you dozens of extra articles. Sign up now at mwomag.com. That's mwomag.com. From the company that brought innovation to the ice fishing world with their advancements in LED and glow technology, now brings you a new eco-friendly biosilicone bait that is infused with terabyte, a proprietary solution comprised of amino acid, omega-3, and pheromones that will generate more strikes, which equals more fish. 
For more information, visit fishdaddyoutdoors.com. All right, everyone, we are back and we are here with Josh Woodward of Woodward Fishing, um, a guide in the Wisconsin area, doing a lot of work from Green Bay over to Mille Lacs, Minnesota. You know, you cover a lot of water, don't you, Josh? Yeah, yeah, I get around, that's for sure. Speaking of getting around, we're always driving somewhere in this past weekend. You know, we've been talking about I was up at the Sturgeon Bay Open, seeing some big old smallmouth weighed in. Um, first first year in a while, an eight-pounder wasn't weighed in, you know, but good old John yeah. normally catches big wall. I caught a 7-7 seven, seven smallie, so, you know, he can't that's stay. Sad. That's what I heard. He can't stay away from big fish. Yeah. So, you know, it had me thinking. I I adore Door County. Um, no play on words. It's you know, on purpose there, but it, it's such a diverse fishery. Obviously the land itself is one of the most diverse places in the country. Um, but the water itself is unbelievable. And whether you're at the very tip of it, you know, up towards Washington Island, or you're down at the bottom in Sturgeon Bay, um, mm -hmm. it seems to be quality fish everywhere. I mean, it, it's such a unique, you know, diverse fishery even depending on where you're at in door county i yeah. mean you have the bay side you have the lake side um the water clarity just you know gets clearer the farther you go north mm -hmm. um a lot of options yeah and we're not we're not even going to focus on that inland water today but that's yeah. hidden gems there too you know yeah yeah um, for sure you know so we'll, we'll start with the smallmouth right so I found something really unique this weekend. I got a few hours to fish and I knew they were on beds in sturgeon, at least a lot of fish. You know, I we we reviewed the tournament, we we went over, we talked to multiple anglers, and most, not all, including the women, supposedly didn't catch betting fish. Um, so obviously they're in different stages. When you have that much water, you have that many fish, fish are always gonna be in different spots, right? Yeah, you have multiple different phases coming through, so. Absolutely. Yeah. But the interesting thing is, you know, we run, what, one harbor north to Egg Harbor, and we see 100 beds in sturgeon, and we get to Egg Harbor, and it's one degree cooler, and don't see a single bed. Yeah, and that's that's pretty typical from what I see. I mean, the, the further you go, you know, north in Door County, it is that much more delayed, that spawn. Yeah. Um, is that something you see with all the fish? usually um the smallmouth seem to be more um you know more delayed i would say than than like the walleyes yeah um, as soon as soon as the ice comes off you know sturgeon bay in particular and just that that kind of east side of the bay they're thinking about spawning right away you know similar with the west shore and water temperature doesn't it always plays a factor um but it doesn't seem to be the factor it's just whenever that ice comes off you know they're they're thinking about spawning this was a really unique year uh to where we had open water for a very long time and right away i mean there there were fish um you know biting walleyes but it did it did take a little bit for them to set up it seemed like in into kind of that pre-spawn mode yeah. and that was the first year that i'd ever really seen that because typically as soon as that ice comes off they're they're you know thinking spawning and so so typically right ice comes off um you see your white fish you see your walleye um we're still seeing the suckers pretty shallow this week you know yeah bass fishing they were kind of getting out of there i know i ran into those during the walleye run you know in green bay mm -hmm. pretty thick um now once these bass get off their beds um obviously there's way more places to catch them then you know from shallow to deep it kind of seems like you can catch fish throughout the summer in both phases but what else gets moving you know i, I know we've caught an occasional big musk here an occasional big pike you don't see a whole lot of them but we've caught some of those, you know, um, I know the water's clean, right? So there's probably not a whole lot of catfish or stuff, but I was wondering if everyone thinks of Door County, I think they think walleye and mostly bass, you know? So what are some yep. other things that are going on up there that maybe the average guy that only goes up there once a year doesn't really think about? I mean, it's an amazing brown trout fishery up there. Um, you know, especially uh, on the bay side that I think is 
pretty, pretty untapped. Um, the lakeside is, you know, well known for being, uh, you know, an amazing trout fishery, but there's, there's actually really big browns uh, that become, you know, an option for, you know, other than walleyes and smallmouth. Right, right away at ice out is a really good time to target the browns. What's what's the salmonoid fishery like in the bay? Do they exist at all in the bay during the summer, or do they all pretty much go out of the bay into the lake? So the, that the whole trout thing, that's not really anywhere in my domain. I I don't target them. No. Uh, this was my first year, kind of kind of uh, playing around with the browns, sure. and actually had some success with it. But by no means am I uh, a trout guy. So it's something I would like to learn, and it's very intriguing to me, but um, that's that's kind of uncharted for me. So, All right. Well, next next episode, when we talk to Dumper Dan out of Sheboygan, he might know a little bit more. You know, he stays out deep. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right. So, I mean, we'll keep it. We'll keep it closer to the shore then. Um, so let's talk about fall then, right? Because I was I just got done. We're talking about spawning because it's what's going on now, but... I just got done telling people on the podcast that there's more and more science behind how, why we shouldn't, you know, fish for those fish on beds, you know, yeah, trying to let them do what they're doing. And I feel like so many people get jacked up and feel like that's the time they have to go because they're scared of the big water, you know, mm-hmm. whether they admit that or not. And if scared's the right word or not, but they know the fish are going to be where they can see, right? So it's not right. it's not taxing on them, you know. Um, but I, I feel like the best fishing of Door County is far from the spawn. Yeah, I I mean my my absolute favorite time to be over there is definitely the pre-spawn, um, mm-hmm. and that's for both you know walleyes and smallmouth. Sure. Um, I think that people are. You know, maybe scared isn't the right word, but just overwhelmed, intimidated. Yep. Because yep. uh, you just have, I mean, it's such big water, you know, and and that that pre-spawn, you know, phase, I think it's it's still good for the average angler, you know, when fish are running in shallow, being able to, you know, pick out those spots and target them. And then obviously, like you said, when they get on beds, it becomes more of a visual thing. Right. You can just go and use your eyes and look and find them. And then when you have the post spawn, um, you know, you have fish that obviously split and you have fish that stay shallow, fish that run deep, fish that go offshore. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what makes Door County, you know, um, and then there's other fisheries like this, but it it makes a lot of fun because you, you have fish that do stay shallow and do stay in Sturgeon Bay and little sturgeon all year long. And I call those, you know, resident fish. Yeah. Um, and then you have fish that, you know, push offshore, they go to the reefs. Um, and they're a little bit more prone to do that the further north you go from what I see. Yeah. Uh, the Sister Bay, you know, Ephraim area, a lot of those fish push offshore to a lot of those shoals and reefs mm-hmm. um, after the spawn. And that, that can be an amazing time because they really, really school up. Yeah, speaking um, of offshore up that way, you know, um, once you get north of Sturgeon, you start running into some islands, right? I feel like yep. Washington Island's known really well, but you have Strawberry Island, you have uh, your sis- sister islands. Um, how how does someone fish those? Because I, I catch fish around them, right? Occasional accidental walleye early in the bass season. Um, but I catch bass, especially pre-spawn, spawn, and just after post-spawn. Seems like a, the, my best time on those islands but mm-hmm. how, how do you fish those do you treat the island like a shoreline like that would be on the main lake or is it a little early a little late you know is there anything you do differently when fishing an island you know i i guess you do treat that more i i i, I treat that more like a shoreline um yeah. than i would necessarily like the shoals and the reefs you know i treat those more as like offshore structure Obviously, forward-facing sonar has really changed the game when it comes to, I mean, not just shallow water fishing, but obviously offshore fishing and deep water fishing. Yeah. Um, that's, you know, made, I guess, you know, uh, the summer walleyes up there, um, you know, historically has been known more as like a trolling thing. 
uh, to locate fish. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, if you do locate them, then, you know, guys cast around now with forward facing, I mean, it's unlocked this entire casting bite for walleyes all summer long. And August now is probably the best walleye fishing on the bay. Wow. Um, if you're specifically talking about targeting big ones too, yeah. Um, yeah. it's a very good time to target big fish. So are they um, now, I, I, I think the average person, you know, thinks that middle of the heat, August get 90 degree weather, like Northern Wisconsin never sees. Um, the, I think everyone would think right away, those fish are very deep. Is that always the case or not always? Not at all. I've, I've seen walleyes go, you know, very shallow up on those reefs, even in, you know, five feet of water um, in August. I mean, they can be right on top. And a lot of that's just driven, you know, by where the bait's at. So, yep. you know, wind currents, come into play and that can push bait up shallow, you know, up onto those reefs. And that's where the walleyes are going to be when that water temperature is high. I mean, their metabolism is high and they're, they're wanting to eat. Yeah. Walleye, you know, they can be tough to catch, but they like to eat, you know, and you yeah. can see that yep. when they're bulking, you know, you see how big those fish are. And in the summertime, you know, for when specifically talking about walleyes, I, I have my best luck with, with those reaction bites. So, you know, using lures that trigger that, you know, that play off of their instinct, just to, just to pounce on a bait, you know, they can't help themselves when something comes, you know, darting by them erratically and you're kind of making that bite happen. I, Memorial Day weekend is right around the corner, right? Um, I myself will be headed up to Sister Bay for the weekend. Mm -hmm. um, We'll put you in the driver's seat, Josh. You're you're headed up right now. You know what are um, let's let's do four. Let's not get too complicated. You got okay. four rods. You got a you got four rods. You got to tie up. They could be casting or spinning. You you choose. Um, what what are we thinking? We're bass fishing, right? Just mm -hmm. right. what what are some techniques or styles of baits that you're gonna be locked in on for right now? So if we're talking bass fishing. I get four rods. You said. If you need a fifth, you know, I'll let it, but you know, I, I, I can do a four. Well, uh, I'm going all spinning. Okay. And you want me to talk about, I mean, just the whole, the whole setup. Yeah. I mean, you don't have to, if there's any, you know, dire secrets that you have to kill me over, we don't have to talk about yeah. that. Yeah. No, I, I, I'd love to hear it. You know, if you're a braid to floral guy, you know, or what's, what's the deal going? Yeah. So I'm not, I mean, number one, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to have a hair jig rod. So Something in that that seven six uh, medium light uh, fast action with uh, six pound fluoro rigged it up, and that's kind of my go to hair jig rod. Um, having that that extra length, you know, it, it, the casting distance is key uh, when you're using hair jigs, and especially the further north you go, and that water does get clear. Um, that can make or break your day uh, on a really calm day because you can see those fish visually, you know, sometimes down even in 10, 15 feet of water. Sure. That's where you kind of got to get pretty stealthy. The light lines, six pound fluoro, you know, making bomb cast at them. But um, yeah, they'll, they'll eat a hair jig. So, so that would be probably my, my number one um, that I'm going to be using. Okay. Number two is going to be uh, somewhere around, uh, like a six ten medium light yeah. with, uh, 10 pound braid to a 10 pound floral leader. And I use a FG knot, uh, for my connection knot on my braid to floral. And I, I run, you know, probably somewhere between 20 to 25 foot fluorocarbon leaders. You know, I don't, I don't think it makes or breaks a day, but I, it definitely gets more bites having that, that longer floral leader, just being a little bit more stealthy. Yeah. And I do like to jump up to that 10 pound just because of those zebra muscles. Mm -hmm. um, anything lighter than that, if you're running like bottom baits, which my second setup is going to be some sort of tube, some uh, finesse tube, like a 2.5 inch tube. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're running those bottom, you know, baits on the bottom around zebras, uh, your line takes a beating. And uh, my experience under 10 pound, you're going to break off on fish that you don't want to break off on. Sure. So. Sure. Yeah. And with the tube, um, you know, eight, eight ounce is, is kind of my go-to. So I'll, I'll drop down to 16th if I'm, you know, real shallow. 
um, or if they're just not, you know, in a, in a, in a good mood, um, that slower fall, you know, really seems to, uh, trigger more bites when they're just kind of, kind of in a mood, but eight ounce is always kind of my starting point and I'll go up or down a little from there, just depending on the depth. Um, let's see number, number three, um, I'm going to say uh, like a seven foot medium spinning, uh, same setup on line, 10 pound, you know, braid, do a 10 pound floor, row, yep. 25 foot leader. And uh, I'm going to go with uh, the quarter ounce dark sleeper okay. from Meg Bess. Um, yep. Especially up in the northern parts of Door County, that is a really good day to use that one can be really hard to beat and it's super versatile because you can fish it super slow yeah. kind of drag it like a tube um i mean you can reel it in like a swim bait so you can you can kind of you you can you can cover a lot of uh different areas of the water column depending on the mood that the fish are in and it's super versatile yeah and then number four is going to be a jerk bait um i played around with my jerk baits over the years, I used to only throw them on casting rods, uh, running like 12 pound fluoro. Anymore, I'm pretty much exclusively throwing them on spinning rods. And that has to do more with just casting distance. Yeah. Um, I feel like just with, with the spinning rod and the, the jerk baits, I, I do like to go a little bit smaller so i like the uh like the mega bass uh vision 110 junior the plus one especially that's kind of my my go-to sure. so using those you know a little bit smaller jerk baits uh, i like throwing those on spinning for sure and uh just to get that little more casting distance especially if you have a headwind sometimes the uh you know you just can't quite get it with the casting rods Absolutely. especially going up you know with a little bit heavier line and then I like having um, that smoother drag of a spinning. So especially when you're talking Door County, like big smallmouth, you know, you hook a six pounder, it's nice to have that drag. No, absolutely. Uh, smallmouth don't like to stay pinned on treble hooks. Um, so I, yeah. I found that my, my, uh, my hookup rate and fish in the boat uh, dramatically increased by throwing them, you know, throwing them on spinning rods. I think, uh, I think a lot of that has to do, I I've also played around my whole career kind of casting versus spinning on, on mm -hmm. fishing, you know? And I feel like I, I want casting mentally because it's more comfortable to snap that way and reel, you know? Yep. Yeah. But I also believe that a spinning rod, it's kind of known to have a little bit of a, more of a play you know softer tip mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. i think the way that loads up kind of gives that bait a little more end action you know too yeah well 100 and that's actually i'm glad you brought that up um that was the other thing that i noticed was you can even have a jerk bait do different things from you know for what you want it to do by by what rod you're using. So I I don't have like a dedicated jerk bait rod. Sure. You know in in the year when the water temperature is really cold, and I'm targeting smallmouth, I like to go to more. I'll actually throw a medium light spinning rod, like a six nine medium light. And instead of, you know, really doing that, that, you know, you know, cracking that and getting that really erratic darting, I'll almost just do like a, like a pull, like a long pull followed by like a little tap. And you're not really getting that extreme darting slashing action. It's more of just a, you know, kind of a, kind of a smoother, you know, not quite as erratic. And I seem to get more bites when, when the water's cooler. Now, once once things start kicking in and that water gets up you know upper 40s 50s that's when i i like to go to more of a like a medium fast and you know a little bit stiffer it's a lot easier to kind of crack that and get those real tight sharp turns on that jerk bait yeah it's 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 definitely a bait that is super versatile you know especially with the forward facing sonar technology yeah. i feel like we saw we saw the change right away kind of on the uh 
on like the MLF stage when they were still doing the every fish counts thing, you know, mm -hmm. um, because the jerk bait always known as kind of an early spring, late fall bait, all of a sudden, mm -hmm. all of a sudden Kevin Van Dam wins a tournament's like, yeah, uh, we didn't have cameras in our boats all the time, but I've been doing this year round for 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. So even still for me, it's hard. A, a, I don't love fishing a jerk bait. I'll be the first one to say that. Um, probably just because of the, the ADHD, the patience, right? So, um, but again, when that, we were talking about the walleye getting hungry, you know, all the fish metabolisms speed up yep. once, once we get into the, the hot months and you can work that thing. You don't have to be patient anymore with a jerk bait, you know? No, no, no. It, uh, yeah. And I think, especially with forward facing, if you know that you're around fish, um, and you're specifically, you know, targeting them, it can be a, a power fishing um, lure for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so not, you know, it's not, you know, you, you throw it out there, crack it three times and wait yeah. 15 seconds. Like you can watch that sonar and the fish is going to let you know how they want. You know, I, I, I probably, I, I, I throw a lot of jerk baits. That's probably one of my favorite things to actually throw. Mm -hmm. And more times than not, I'm fishing it pretty fast, probably faster than most people. Sure. Um, my pauses in between. Uh, so so I, I talked about the previous cadence that I like when that water's cold, and that as that water warms up, I'll crack it two or three times, you know, real hard on slack line to get those erratic, you know, uh, jerks. And then I'm maybe one to two seconds, and then I'm back into you know, two, three cracks, one second pause, two, three cracks. Um, so I'm not letting it sit very long. Well, Josh, you know, we could talk to you for hours and hours about it. Yeah. Like said, it's tons of water. Um, but we just wanted to talk about what's going on kind of right now, you know. Yeah. Um, now, we did do a little Q&A with the anglers up at the Sturgeon Bay Open this week. And I have three results from three questions, okay? I'm going to ask you those three okay. before let you go and see if you give the same answer okay okay number one technique to catch smallmouth year round in door county the number one technique to catch smallmouth year round in door county so i'm gonna say if you if you only get one you have to use a year round yep i'm gonna go with some with a, a some sort of swim bait that was the number two answer. I think the number one answer though was drop shot. Okay. Yeah. And like, that was going to be my, my second. Yeah. Um, was a drop shot. I think the swim bait though would still be my number one because it's it, I still think it's more versatile than a drop shot. All right. Yeah. That can be fished from anywhere from one yeah. foot to any speed, to any, yeah. it, any yeah. speed. Yep. Yep. Out of all the harbors in door County, which harbor is home to the largest smallmouth? Uh, little sturgeon, hands down. That is the overwhelming answer is little yep. sturgeon. Yep. Yeah. Which didn't, I didn't know that. I think I'm going to have to spend yep. a little more time in the little sturge. Yep. Yep. All right. And number three, this is just, this is just a pissing contest now. Your largest, your largest smallmouth. We're getting everyone's PV, Josh. What's your PV? Seven two. Seven two. It's a nice fish. Yep. 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 All right. Well, hey, Josh, if someone wants to book a guide with you, learn more about catching these fish, whether that's Door County or other elsewhere, uh, how do they get a hold of you? Uh just check out my website at woodwardfishing.com. Uh also on Instagram, uh Woodward Fishing. Uh that's gonna be the easiest way. All right. Well, hey, we'll put the link below. Josh, I want to say thank you. Thanks for joining us. Um, yeah. I tried to get together and do this, but, you know, life happens sometimes. Yeah, I know. I know. We, we, this was kind of a long time coming, so. I know. I'm glad and, we uh, finally got to, got to do this. We do want to congratulate you on becoming a dad. Thank you. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, that's great. Father's Day's coming up, so I hope you enjoy your first one officially. Yep, I'm hoping we can spend it on the water, so we've gotten out of, we've gotten out a couple times already. Awesome. Which has been awesome. So she's gonna be kicking butt. She's gonna be kicking butt by age. Yep. Yep. All right, everyone. Sure. That's Josh Woodward. Thanks for joining us today. 
and hope you guys learned a little bit about Door County fishing. Midwest Outdoors Magazine helps you enjoy the outdoors, giving you the best information on where to go, what to use, and how to use it. With fishing maps marked by the pros, nature notes, in-depth interviews, and much, much more. Your subscription gets you 10 big issues of the best in fishing, hunting, and the great outdoors. Plus, Midwest Outdoors Digital Edition gives you dozens of extra articles. Sign up now at mwomag.com. That's mwomag.com. From the company that brought innovation to the ice fishing world with their advancements in LED and glow technology, now brings you a new eco-friendly biosilicone bait that is infused with terabyte. A proprietary solution comprised of amino acid, omega-3, and pheromones that will generate more strikes, which equals more fish. For more information, visit fishdaddyoutdoors.com. Welcome back, everyone. Hey, I hope you guys enjoyed that interview with Josh as much as I do. There's sometimes there's a moment, right, when you're talking to someone and you just realize you're on the same wavelength. Listen, Josh is as obsessed with fishing as I am. Um, you know, he's a firefighter by, by trade, and I can appreciate that after, you know, that's what I did for a little bit before we really took a turn into the fishing world. But I'm sure that's going to happen with him at some point. You know, he's just going to not be able to stay off the water every day. But Hey, Josh, thank you for what you do when you're not fishing, and thank you for all that fishing advice and getting people out. Also, guys, Josh is a full-time guide, as mentioned, so if you ever all want to get out with him, whether it's for muskie, for walleye, or for bass, give Josh a call. His number's down below. So today I want to go over these new line of baits from Berkeley, and we've touched on them before in prior shows, but truly a revolutionary style of fishing, and that's forward-facing sonar fishing, right? And Berkeley has come out with forward-facing sonar baits specifically. And you can see the way they're designed and the way they're shaped. They are heavy in the front, makes for precision casting and quick rate of fall, which is important for getting to these fish that you see in real time because they can move just as fast as your bait can move. So you wanna get them as quick as possible. And then you have that ergonomic design to help it flutter and hover when you're holding it, but then it's worked like a jig. It's got a flat bottom, and you can let this come all the way down to the ground. You can snap jig it. Um, you can yo-yo it off the bottom. But again, it's nice because you can also fish it vertically mid-column, and they have sizes for anything you want to do, whether it's Tennessee River bass or Green Bay walleye on something like this. This style bait is perfect for chasing open water walleye, especially in the summer when they're more pressured. Um, it's great for smallmouth bass, largemouth bass, spotted bass. But the unique thing about this exact bait actually is we were sent these right after ICAST last year. So we've been sitting on them for a little bit and we were able to bring them out ice fishing and they put in some work. So although never designed or thought about as an ice fishing bait, Make sure you don't put these away at the end of the open water season this year. You know, I haven't even seen this one advertised, and I think this is my favorite one of the power switches because talk about the size of perch and crappie you can catch with this bait and the style of bait. You know, you can use it in so many different situations. A really cool bait from Berkeley. I'm certainly super excited to check it out and fish it, you know. One of the coolest things about it is the real realistic view, right? The colors and the shape. I mean, that looks like a bait fish. That looks like a little smelt to me. So guys, if you want to try a new style of bait, if you want to try to catch fish that you normally can't catch, whether they're suspended or midsummer pattern, this is a bait I would highly recommend giving a try this year too. Alrighty. Well, everyone, thank you for joining us for another show. It's sad, but true. We've come to the end. Um, I want to thank Josh, I want to thank Greg, and all our guests that made this week possible. As always, want to thank the people over at Fish Daddy. If you guys haven't yet, make sure you check out the new line of open water baits for Fish Daddy. We are going to be going over those shortly, so please come back. Subscribe if you haven't. Check us out on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. 
As always, guys, I'm Jim O'Neill. We will see you guys next time on the water.